Okay, so yesterday we were looking at implementation of dynamic logic circuits, right? The main idea in dynamic logic is you go through a two phase kind of computation, right? In normal combinational logic circuits, you just apply the inputs and after some propagation delay, which is determined by the size of transistors, the load and so on, the outputs will settle to their correct values. Right? So, it is possible to sort of define the propagation delay in terms of how long it takes for the change in input to reflect at the output. Okay? Whereas over here, we are now talking about a two phase system. We have the pre-charge and followed by the evaluate phases. Right? The thing about pre-charging is it can be done in parallel across all the circuits and across all the gates that are there in the circuit. Okay? which means that effectively the time required for pre-charging is constant irrespective of which gate it is or constant meaning that within that pre-charge time all the gates will get pre-charged high. After that you have an evaluation phase where there is a possibility of a signal sort of rippling through multiple gates, right? It first goes through the first gate, that in turn causes a change at the second gate and so on. So what we saw first was the regular dynamic logic, the first idea that we had where we just used the pull down network, but on the pull up path alone, we, or rather we attached a pull up and pull down PMOS and NMOS with a clock attached to it to take care of the two phases. There was this problem that supposing an input is going to fall during the evaluation phase, it can cause the output to go wrong, right? It will be neither at 0 nor at VDD and will get stuck somewhere in between. To avoid that, the final thing that we saw before the end of yesterday's class was the so called domino logic, right? where the idea is once again you have one PMOS pull up, a pull down network, an NMOS pull down, clock is connected to both of these, the output is taken from here but put through an inverter so that the output is always inverted from whatever is actually being computed by the pull down network. Okay. Now, the first thing that this means is that domino kind of gates can only implement what kind of logic? Remember what we said about CMOS. CMOS could in, uh, implement only inverting logic, this can implement only non-inverting. Okay. So, in particular, you can get an AND gate, you cannot build a NAND gate out of it, right? This is slightly more serious than it sounds. In the case of CMOS, you could always take two inverting gates, cascade them and get a <coughs> non-inverting output. Whereas, if your gates can only do non-inverting computation to start with, it is not possible to get an inverted output from this, okay? So, there are certain problems that arise because of this. What that ends up meaning is that, you have to reframe all your logic in such a way that you can do it in terms of non-inverting computations. Okay. So, on the other hand, I mean, in spite of that, it is still quite useful. There are a lot of logic which basically involves like, you know, AND gates, OR gates kind of things, which can be implemented using Domino. In certain cases, if you need to have the inverting logic as well, then you probably need to use explicit separate static inverters in order to get that computation. Okay. Why does it work? The main thing that it requires over here is all of these inputs should be guaranteed to be low as you are entering the evaluation phase. Okay. Because if, if those inputs are high, there is a possibility that the pull down network is active as soon as you enter the evaluation phase and later can become inactive. Okay. So, that is one problem that you need to actually take care of and that you do not want to see in this kind of a network, right? The fact that it is non-inverting does limit the kind of application that you have, that it is not in lots of places that you can do it, but there are sufficient uses or at least there were sufficient uses of this that it was a very sort of popular approach for very high speed circuits, okay? This was probably around 10-15 years ago or so, at a time when the static CMOS Compared to that, the speed that you could get from a dynamic logic approach like this was much higher. So, some of the high end processors would go for this kind of logic, especially in their main computational paths. Okay? 
nowadays domino and in general other forms of dynamic logic are much less prevalent one of the main reasons is the main one of the big issues as far as dynamic logic in general is concerned right is this problem of leakage right we looked at a whole bunch of disadvantages yesterday but one of the main issues over there is this problem of leakage which means that i need to get back into a precharged state within a certain amount of time because otherwise there is a possibility that my output has been left floating for a long time and could drift away from the zero or vdd that it was supposed to be okay drift away meaning some sub threshold leakage current could cause that uh, some charge to get deposited on the output capacitor and cause it to go either towards vdd or towards ground you cannot say that's the whole point of saying that the node is floating okay so if that or rather it will usually be the other way i mean this point will be precharged high the pull down network is off so during the evaluation phase both pull up and pull down are inactive the node is floating which means that it could go away from where it was supposed to be okay what that means is that i need a minimum clock frequency okay right think carefully about this normally when we are talking about circuits of course we haven't got to the timing analysis yet but you probably know that you know in general we talk about what is the fastest speed at which a circuit can operate right so even the processors you talk about something like a 3 gigahertz processor when we say 3 gigahertz processor what we are saying is it cannot operate faster than 3 gigahertz otherwise there will be timing errors right if i have some other asic that's designed for 200 megahertz operation it means that up to 200 megahertz the chip can operate beyond that it's likely to give timing errors so we are always talking about a maximum frequency here we are talking about a minimum frequency right the reason why that's coming up is if i do not precharge again within a certain amount of time then there is a possibility that because of leakage the signal could have drifted quite far away from my zero or vdd value that i want okay that is of course undesirable but the main point is we can get around it by saying okay you know as long as i am operating at least at 100 megahertz or at least at this speed it means that before the drift can happen by a certain amount right more than so many millivolts i'll be able to catch it and precharge it again get it back to a known state okay so this idea of a minimum clock frequency is required for dynamic circuits in general of course domino is a type of dynamic circuit right now as i told you nowadays dynamic logic circuits are not very popular one of the biggest issues with dynamic logic in terms of present day implementation right domino solves many of the other issues such as the charge leakage sharing and so on right and uh, those kind of problems are uh, well not the leakage and so on but at least the fact about the charge sharing and uh, the fact that the signal can degrade Uh, as a result of the falling transitions on the input right that is solved by domino okay plus that static cmos inverter also makes sure that the actual output of the gate is a proper logic value for a better proportion of the time than if it was just a floating node right because why in this case is actually being held by a static inverter okay so in spite of that the problem is the one of the biggest issues is that distribution of the clock right the fact that every single gate needs that clock signal for it to even operate right means that the entire circuit becomes very cumbersome and difficult to design and build okay so because of that in general domino logic and those kind of things are less popular in terms of design nowadays but this idea of precharge and evaluate is something that we will come back to later when we talk about memory design okay it turns out that this sort of two phase operation is a nice way of speeding up the access to large arrays of data okay where you are storing data and you want to be able to retrieve them quickly right this idea that you can precharge something essentially doing part of the computation and then say i only now need to decide whether it's one or zero and see how quickly to switch okay that part of it turns out to be useful in the design of blocks like memory so the idea of precharge evaluate by itself has value beyond the basic implementation of dynamic logic okay 
All right. Now, one last logic style that we will look at. There are a few others. I'm not covering all of them. Right? Some of them we'll try to look at in other contexts, or they are also mentioned in the books. But this other one is also something that we'll just look at briefly. Right? In this technique, once again, you are trying to, you know, it's going back to the same idea of pseudo n mos. Right? What the dynamic logic do? It said that in pseudo n mos, I have the p mos permanently on. Let me avoid that problem by turning it off during evaluation. But that introduces a clock which makes overall design and implementation a bit more difficult. Okay? Instead, this other kind of logic which is called differential cascode voltage switching logic. Right? Don't worry too much about the name. It's DC VSL is how it's usually referred to. Why that name is coming differential cascode voltage switching, we'll see in a moment. Okay. What this does is it says, alright, I will use the same idea. I have a PMOS pull up, I have a pull down network. Right? So far so good. Now, what was my problem? The problem was the PMOS was permanently on in the case of pseudo MOS or required a clock in the case of dynamic logic. Okay? I will look at yet another way by which I can sort of prevent that PMOS contention from happening, PMOS versus NMOS contention from happening. Right? And the approach that I am going to follow here is, I will put another sort of a mirror of this. Call this PDN1, call this PDN2. Okay? Now, what I am going to do is, the output has been generated from PDN2, I will connect it to the first PMOS. The output being generated from PDN1, I will connect it to the second PMOS. Okay? And I need to put an additional condition. PDN1 and PDN2 have to be complements of each other. Okay? That's all. Complements meaning if one is active, the other is guaranteed to be inactive and the other way around. Right? Active meaning that there is an active pull down path, any active pull down path, right? So if there is one active pull down path, the other one should not have an active pull down path and vice versa. If one does not have an active pull down path, the other one is guaranteed to have an active pull down path. Okay? An example of this would be, this is one and this is its complement. A bar, B bar have to be applied on the other one. Okay. So, how does this work? In this case, for example, if A and B are applied to the left hand side pull down network, if A and B are both equal to 1, it means that A bar and B bar are both equal to 0. Okay. What that means is A and B, that pull down network is equal to, is active, but the A bar, B bar, both the NMOS, NMOS transistors on the right hand side are off. Okay. But if any one of them, A or B, is equal to 0, the corresponding A bar or B bar will be equal to 1, which means that one of the NMOS on the right hand side will get active. Okay? Now, what happens as a result of this? Let us consider the case where PDM1 is active. Okay? So, what happens when PDM1 becomes active? It tries to pull this node X. down towards ground. Okay? What is preventing it from pulling it down to ground? What if anything is pulling it, preventing it from pulling it down to ground? That PMOS, right? The PMOS which is there just above PDN1. Okay? It is possible that it is on. Okay? We don't know yet, but let us consider the case where it is on. Okay? So, in other words, I am considering a case where initially, x is equal to 1, y is equal to 0. Right? Let us start with that situation and see how it operates. Now PDN1 becomes active. Okay? 
what will happen now? X was at 1, Y was at 0, which means that the PMOS M1 is on and M2 is off to start with. Okay? Then PDN1 becomes active. Now I have contention between M1 and the pull down network, PDN1. Okay, what do I mean by contention? Both are on. The voltage at their junction point is going to be determined by their relative sizes. Okay, how big are the transistors in PDN1 compared to M1? That will determine how much that voltage will drop. Okay, now the question is how much does it need to drop? What would you say? What happens as the voltage at X starts dropping? Is there anything that will help us? Right? What will happen once X drops below VDD minus VT? As soon as X drops below VDD minus VT, M2 turns on. Okay? Which means that now M2 is trying to pull up Y. Admittedly with a small current because its VGS is still quite small, but it is conducting nevertheless. Okay? So, it will try to pull Y upwards and M2 does not see any contention because PDN2 is off. Okay? So, it is the only one trying to pull up Y, nothing is opposing it. Even with a small current, it will succeed. Some amount of charge will flow in there and it will start pulling Y upwards. Okay? As soon as the voltage at Y starts increasing, what happens to M1? Its VGS is decreasing. Okay? The VGS across M1 is decreasing. The amount of current that it can deliver becomes a bit less. Effectively, it has become a bit weaker than the PDN1. Okay? So, PDN1 is doing better. It will be able to pull X even further down. As soon as that happens, M2 becomes stronger, pumps more current into Y, raises the voltage at Y. That causes M1 to become even weaker. So, we have a positive feedback loop. Okay. So, once PDN1 becomes active, voltage at X decreases, M2 turns on, pulls up the voltage at Y, this decreases the strength of M1. And overall, we have a positive feedback loop. Where does this end? It ends when x becomes 0, y becomes 1. Okay? So, that is essentially where the thing was finally going to terminate. So, effectively what have we done over here? By adding this extra parallel network, right? Normally, I would have needed only one PMOS and one pull down network. I am adding one extra M2 and the PDN2, okay? The result of that is, it once again tries to solve the problem with pseudo MOS, which is the fact that the PMOS is permanently on. In this case, how does it solve it? It says that the PMOS will start weakening after a while as soon as the other side of the network starts going upwards and this positive feedback will help me to switch more quickly okay the advantage is i don't need a clock right so i don't have the dynamic logic kind of problem i don't have all the associated problems with it this is essentially static right i don't have a minimum clock frequency i don't have any floating nodes once the feedback kicks in, it makes sure that the voltages get pulled up properly to 0 or to VDD. Okay. What is the disadvantage? Very obvious. The big problem is twice the size. Right? I effectively have two networks. There is one more disadvantage which is there. What is that? No, delay will actually decrease. I mean, yeah, you need both A and A bar. 
okay delay is something else i mean it, it's not very obvious see the positive feedback will actually help you so what will happen as a result of the positive feedback is the moment that this starts decreasing very quickly it will switch over and pull up okay because effectively what is happening over there is that the thing that was pulling the other side down is being turned off and this one is turning on at the same time so the positive feedback will actually help in terms of the overall delay at least compared to pseudo nmos right without having to worry about sizing the gates very large or making the size of the gates very large okay the problem is a and a bar right the size is of course an issue and the fact that i need both a and a bar is also another issue right now yeah correct so that is actually another important problem it's not a disadvantage but what does that mean what are, what is the implication of that what kind of logic is this we used a term for it when we were talking about pseudo nmos huh that's exactly right i mean that's an important point right the functionality of this entire gate it's ratio logic right unless the ratios of the sizes of m1 and pdn1 are chosen properly x will not even go down below vdd minus vt if that happens m2 will never turn on y will not increase the positive feedback loop will not be set up the whole gate will not work at all okay so this is a ratio logic So, like I said, the disadvantage, of course, is having twice the number of gates plus the fact that I need both A and A bar. The second problem, in some sense, is slightly less of an issue. Why is that? Why is it that? Huh? Correct. If you are using these kind of gates, you are actually generating Q as well as Q bar. right every gate of this sort automatically generates both a signal and the complement of the signal so if i am taking the output of one gate and connecting it to another right i will need both the q and the q bar but they are being generated anyway by this gate so i don't need a, an extra inverter okay so this does require both the signal and its complement but it also generates both signal and its complement so you don't need the extra inverters to generate the complement but on the other hand you still have to route it right meaning that you need to have figure out some place for the wires to run right you need to connect them and you also have that extra space occupied by the transistors themselves okay so certain kinds of situations where you have the requirement for both a and a bar and you know i mean you are generating those so for example certain kinds of decoders and so on right typically have like large and or nand chains which involve both a and a bar b and b bar and so on you need to have all of those in order to generate the correct set of outputs from the decoder right let's say i want a decoder which will go high any time that a signal becomes equal to 0010 right essentially i'll be doing a bar b bar c b bar okay so whenever that happens i want it to become i want the and of that to happen right so i need a bar b bar c and d bar supposing the decoder also needs to trigger for a b bar c d bar or something else then i need the a and a bar okay so such kinds of situations are places where the requirement for both a signal and its complement is always there normally what is done would be you actually put an explicit inverter if you are using logic of this sort you may be able to get by without doing that okay the other thing is let's say that what i want is a and gate instead of a nand gate right in static cmos what would i do i would take a nand and then invert it okay here i don't need to do that because it's automatically generating the and also okay so i am generating both the and and the nand input uh, nand outputs simultaneously is that useful or is it a waste of space ultimately see the important point is this these are all different design styles there is no single best solution in all cases okay the whole idea of design is you know different techniques 
and you apply the right one for the problem at hand. Okay. How do you evaluate between them? What are the advantages and disadvantages of different techniques? Which one should you choose for the application that you have? That is pretty much what we as a designer are trying to learn. Okay. If you want to summarize the whole course and throw out whatever we have been doing so far, you can pretty much say that right now the winner is static CMOS. Okay, use it for pretty much everything you want unless you have some really specific needs which are unlikely in most of the cases. So static CMOS right, had dis disadvantages, most of which were overcome with time. Right? Initially, you might have seen that you know, the CMOS gates that you use on breadboards for example are typically the older kind of CMOS gates, they require like 15 volts. There are other ones which require 5 volts. Right? So they require a higher potential for operating, they might need some other kind of setup. Right? They were in general bit more clunky and difficult to operate than the BJT kind of circuits to start with. But the rate at which technology advanced was essentially such that sizes shrank, speeds became faster, power dissipation reduced and overall the simplicity of design with static CMOS was such that it pretty much became the most dominant form of design. Mm -hmm. Okay. All these other things though are useful, even if you are not directly doing design using these techniques, there may be some ideas from here that will apply to other kinds of circuits that you build. Okay. One example is the pre-charge evaluate kind of operation which I just described. Right. Like I said, we will see later that in SRAM design, memory design, you will make use of that and it actually becomes a useful idea to make the SRAM access faster. Okay. Alright, so what I am going to do now is finish up and this is the end of our discussion of combinational logic circuits. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, so the X is equal to 1 by square 0 initially. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can we be sure that it will be always common it cannot be 0 0? Well, yeah, so can it be? So that is the question, right? No, alright, let us just quickly look at that. What happens if let us say X and Y are both 0? Okay. Somehow, whatever you have switched on the system, somehow x and y are both at 0. Okay. Now, x and y are both at 0 means m1 and m2 are both on. Okay. Both of them are trying to pull x and y upwards. Okay. Which one will win is the question. Right? One of the PDNs is off. That one is not going to offer any opposition to whichever is pulling it up. The other PDN is on. Which means that, supposing let us say PDN1 is on. Right? M1 is trying to pull X up, but it is being opposed by PDN1. M2 is trying to pull Y up, no opposition from PDN2. Which one will rise faster? Y. As soon as Y rises, it starts turning M1 off. And it settles. Okay, so it will settle at Y equal to 1. At that point, M1 has turned off, PDN1 is still on. X will go to 0. Okay. What about the other case? Supposing X and Y were somehow both at 1, right? Both M1 and M2 are off, but one of the PDNs is on. That PDN will start pulling, that corresponds. So PDN1 will start pulling X down to 0. As soon as it drops by a certain amount, M2 will turn on, the feedback loop kicks in and it just goes fast. So, in other words, X equal to 0, Y equal to 0, or X equal to 1, Y equal to 1 is not stable. It is not a situation that can remain in that feedback loop. It will automatically get to provided your PDNs are complementary. That is important, right? So if the PDNs somehow end up in a state where both are off or both are on, then you have other problems that can come out. But that's always the case. I mean, even for static CMOS, I'm connecting A and B, right? Of course, I am just shorting A and B, but you know, so in that case, static CMOS is probably the safest. But supposing I have a situation where, for some reason, I can get A and some other signal over there, and there is some delay in the signal reaching the other PMOS. I could have a situation where the NMOS is on before the PMOS turns off, right? even in static CMOS. I mean, I am talking about a situation like this. Let us say that I have a NMOS transistor over here, a PMOS transistor over here, right? and a wire which is coming from, let us say like this. Okay? And for some reason, let us say this has a delay associated with it. <laughs> Why? Maybe it is some long wire, maybe it was a bad wire because of whatever manufacturing problems, right? but for some reason the delay on this stretch is more. I could have a situation where this, both of these x and y 
although they are logically the same value, will electrically see different signals at a given instant of time. So for a short amount of time, x might be equal to VD, uh, or rather above VDD by 2, at the same time uh, that y is also above VDD by 2, or rather uh, that y is below VDD by 2. What that means is both x and y will effectively look like on signals for the transistors, both NMOS and VMOS can be on. So such a situation in other words can arise. Right? The assumption in all the gates is you are not talking about such transients or any other thing of that sort. Your networks themselves must be sort of stable. right? In this case, I have assumed that I always have whenever A is connected on the left side, A bar will be connected on the right side and so on. right? And that the PDNs have been designed properly. If I mess up with the PDNs and don't have them complementary to each other, I could have a situation where both PDNs are on at the same time or both are off at the same time. In either of those cases, what you said will happen. X and Y could both go to, they could, could both uh, become VDD or could both become zero. So, take care of that by designing it properly. That's all. Okay? Any other questions? Alright. So, so far we have been looking at combinational logic elements. Okay. What happens with combinational logic is simply that I take a gate, I apply certain inputs to it, it performs a computation, whatever is the logic equation defined for that gate and gives me an output. Okay. In the process there is some delay involved which basically says okay, you know, I am applying the signal, some amount of delay, some charging, discharging happens and finally the output changes. Okay. But that is it, if I change another input, it will again take some am finite amount of time and the output will change. Okay. Any time there is a change in input, the output will reflect that. If it is needed for the output to change, the output will change, if it is needed meaning according to the equation. Okay. But there could be situations where I actually want to retain the value at a particular node over a certain amount of time and say that maybe one set of nodes, I want one controlling signal that decides when all of them can change. When they can change, I am not saying whether they should change from 1 to 0 or from 0 to 1 and so on. right? So for example, the simple thing that you can see over there is, supposing I have an AND gate, right? A and B are so called controlling inputs. Right? What that means is, if any one of them is 0, the output is 0. It does not matter what the other one, other signal was. Okay? So, in some sense, this is one way by which I can say, okay, you know, A controls the output of Y. Only when A changes to 1, is the value of B allowed to come through to the output. Okay? But that is not exactly what I am talking about because I have a situation where when A becomes 0, Y also changes back to 0. It does not hold what was the last value that it had. Okay? So, in other words, the question is can I build a device where the output holds the last value that it saw at the input? for a certain amount of time when the controlling signal is turned off. Okay? Logically what we do is we define an element where we say there is a control signal, I will call it G right? and there is a data signal and there is an output. Okay? What I want is whenever G is equal to 0, Q cannot change. Meaning that it must hold whatever it had. If it was a, if it was a 0 before G became 0, Q must remain at 0. If it was 1 before G became 0, Q must remain 1. Okay? I am not saying that when G becomes 0, Q must become 0. That would be an AND gate. That is not what I want. What I want is when G becomes 0, Q must hold whatever value it last had. Okay. When G is equal to 1, 
k is equal to d okay so what can i do with this kind of an element whenever i make g equal to 1 I can keep changing the value at d and that will get reflected at the output. After some time I can freeze it by just saying okay take g to 0. Okay. So how does this help me? It essentially says that I can once again just like I was doing the pre-charge discharge kind of pre-charge evaluate kind of phasing for dynamic logic. I can say I can now divide computation into multiple phases. Right? I can essentially say my output is allowed to change only at certain times when g becomes equal to 1 okay rest of the time that output has to just remain stationary okay how do we use this we use this in order to build the concept of state right so i have a large circuit or a large system and there is some concept of a state associated with it What does that state do? It essentially sends control signals to the various parts of the logic. Right? And the most important part is there must be some form of state update. Okay? So in other words, I have some system, right? It's a bunch of gates that are somehow thrown together over here. But there is some part of that system which is able to in some sense remember okay it has memory of what happened in the past okay so it holds certain values based on the those values there is some other combinational logic which sends off controlling signals triggering different parts of the system but after some time the state can change how do I control when the state changes? It will be controlled by my gate signal, by my control, my enabling signal, G. Okay? As long as that G signal is equal to 0, the state will remain constant and all the control signals that it sends will just be based on that state plus some other inputs that it might see. But when G becomes equal to 1, the state can get updated to a new value. Okay? So this idea is very powerful. This is the core concept behind finite state machines right and finite state machines are actually an abstraction they are, you don't need to think of them only in terms of electrical terms right the idea of a finite state machine is something which can process any kind of information with memory associated with it right so finite state machine theory itself comes is probably more a branch of computer science than electrical engineering strictly right because it deals with all kinds of different finite state machines, finite state systems. Okay? How they evolve, what are the things that can be done in order to analyze them, to study them, how many states do you need? Right? What we are interested in is how do you implement them? Or at least one way of implementing. Them. And what we are saying is one way of implementing finite state machines is you encode the state into a set of these kind of latches or registers, things which can hold memory. And you do computations using the combinational logic that we already know how to build. Use that state update in order to decide how a system will go from one state to another. Okay? This is a very powerful concept. Right? At the core, if you think about it, even the most sophisticated computer that you have, in some sense, is a state machine. Right? Is it a finite state machine? Actually, yes. But on the other hand, what happens in the case of a computer is, you have your CPU and you have a large amount of RAM available to you. The settings that are present in every element of that RAM in some sense contribute towards the set of states in that machine. Okay? So because of that calling it a finite state machine is probably not very meaningful because the number of states is exponentially huge. Right? But the core idea is still the same. You have some system where there is some state that is recorded in some part of the circuit and some computations that are happening by combinational logic in the rest of the circuit causing that state to get updated. The most sophisticated computer that we can think of today uses exactly the same idea. That is state which is evolving with time. Okay. So, these elements that implement state, right, that memory are obviously very important and useful. The question is how do we actually implement something of that sort? 
okay so before we get into the details of how we can implement something like this at the transistor level let's understand a few more things in terms of what are the parameters of interest for such a system okay the first thing that we can think of is like i said this is your element you have a control signal you have a data signal and the output the timing diagram which is use, useful for uh, understanding something like this would be the g signal goes up and down at regular intervals data signal can go up and down arbitrarily something like this what happens to q this first change in data is ignored right i am assuming q is initially zero i don't know but i am assuming it or rather let me just put it as unknown over here right i don't know what the state is what i can say for sure is once g becomes equal to 1 q will become equal to 1 okay but now g is still zero so and uh, still one so it will follow d right any changes in d will come through over here but then what happens is this gets completely ignored why because g was equal to 0 at this point here g became equal to 1 but d is still 0 so nothing happens but over here this value of d will come through to the output okay so this kind of a circuit uh, this kind of a diagram is what is called a timing diagram and is very useful to sort of indicate what kind of behavior i expect from signals right what i have is g and d are the inputs i want to see what q behaves as okay and i can derive that from the behavior of the circuit elements okay one of the things for a circuit element like this is there will be some amount of delay just like there is a combinational delay right from d to q there will be a delay which i usually refer to as tdq okay let me just correct one thing i'm going to change the notation instead of g i'm going to use c everywhere right because it's a clock signal in some sense right and it's the same thing that we'll be using later even for the x triggered kind of systems so there is a delay that will happen whenever there is a change in d how long does it take before the q gets updated okay so for example that happens over here right this change gets reflected over here i have drawn it as though in fact my diagram is particularly bad it looks as though q changed even before d changed in practice it will change a short while after that okay that delay will be tdq okay similarly there will be some delay associated with this right so there will be a clock to q delay which i call t cq okay so this will typically be t cq what does that mean it means that d changed before the clock now the clock has become equal to 1 the output should change okay so whatever was that updated value at d should come through to the output it will take a certain amount of time that delay is my tcq clock to q delay because the d input had changed well before it had changed while clock was zero so what i'm interested in is how long does it take from the clock before the output changes okay so tdq and tcq are sort of what we can think of as our equivalents of the combinational logic propagation delay right it essentially says some signal has changed how long does it take before the output reflects that okay so these are an important set of parameters as far as any kind of sequential element is concerned there are a couple of others which will come up a bit later we will discuss those after some time not right now because it's easier to sort of discuss them in an edge trigger context okay so what is this edge trigger that i am talking about all that i am saying is i can also have a different kind of element over here the notation usually is to put this triangle
and in this case what I have is if C changes like this and D changes like this Q will change only at these points at the edges of C in this case the positive edges that is the edge which is going from 0 to 1 not the negative edges ok what will happen then again I do not know what the value of Q is over here but here after that clock edge I can be sure that Q is equal to 0 and it will be 0 for that entire clock cycle it cannot change even though D is changing after that at the next clock edge it again looks at the value of D now D is high so Q will become high ok this is edge trigger whereas the previous one this one over there was level trigger ok so all this is sort of just setting in place some terminology that we need to understand right to go further into this after that we have got some of the terminology in place we will look at how can these be implemented at the circuit level 